It is my hope that this week's message will ignite your spirit. This week, I stumbled upon a fragment of my past from 1994, remembering Patrick Stewart's, you know, Captain Picard from Star Trek The Next Generation, his SNL monologue that helped set the course for this week's message. We'll plot grace, incongruence, a parable, and Jonah's story into our navigational system and see where it takes us. We'll explore the question, is grace amazing or actually infuriating? And we'll dare to actually ask for whom the bell tolls. Join us as we explore a paradox and are propelled to escape velocity from our self-centered orbits. Let's make it so. Engage. So when you think about crime and the interviewing of suspects, There's always that one question, where were you on the night of, well, fill in the blank. The question always gives me an anxious feeling because I wonder if I would be able to recount my whereabouts at any given time, especially under that kind of pressure. Well, this week, I did see how you could make some connection to derive your whereabouts, even years ago. I was curious about an event, so I did a simple Google. On Saturday, February 5th, 1994, at 11.30 p.m., I was in our apartment in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, watching Patrick Stewart host Saturday Night Live. My friend had introduced me to Star Trek The Next Generation a few years before, and I had come to really enjoy it. They were coming to the end of the series, a seven-year run. And Patrick Stewart, who played Captain Picard, was hosting SNL. In his monologue, Stewart, claiming to be the superfan of the original series and a virtual encyclopedia of Star Trek knowledge and trivia, shared trivia that was hilariously inaccurate. It was all the more funny because of, well, his reputation as a very serious actor and the character he portrayed on The Next Generation. The lights then dimmed, and he began the iconic voiceover that always started the show. Well, at least sort of. It was the kind of humor that I love. He began, Outer Space. The Last Frontier. These are the trips of the Star Trek Enterprise. Its five-year plan calls for us to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilization, to boldly fly where no man has gone in space. And then he said, live long and be happy. I think and thought it was funny because there was a lot of incongruence. His persona as an actor, he was always deliberate, serious, and accurate on the show. And then with this, he butchers the most iconic thing about the show when he was the one that always delivered the opening for the next generation. Intentional incongruence can be really funny. But oftentimes, actual incongruence can be very problematic. The Old Testament lesson and the gospel for today raised an important question for me this week. Is grace actually amazing? Or do we really perceive it as more infuriating? Actually, maybe it's like Einstein said concerning motion, space, and time. It's relative to the point of the observer. We sing the hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, That Saved a Wretch Like Me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. However, from the perspective of our Christian identity, we see Jesus pointing out, and we see Jonah's actions with God pointing out, how there can be some serious congruence issues in our day-to-day words, persona, and action as we ourselves have first received grace. Jonah, 
and those in the parable are singing a sort of popular hymn of the heart. It goes, infuriating grace, it strains unfair, it makes me mad to see a God that stoops to others lost and saves them just like me. The parable has been really sanitized by time, or maybe we don't take the time to really let it sink in. Really, would you run a business this way? What would happen within your workforce? If we admit it and think about our paychecks, I think we would be infuriated with this type of behavior. Yet this is what the kingdom of God is like. And that tells us one very important thing. The kingdom of God does not operate based on human wisdom, but on grace. Despite what you think of Jonah through the story, he is definitely one thing, and that is honest. He comes clean with what's going on on the boat, despite what it's going to cost him. And he levels with God about how he truly feels about his situation outside of Nineveh. God asks, how you doing, buddy? Jonah says, I'm mad as hell. I never should have trusted you. You always do that stupid grace thing. And the Ninevites are stupid jerk faces and really deserve to get what's coming to them. So you're mad? Mad enough to die. Well, how about a congruence check here? Rewind the story on back. Jonah flees from God. Not a good thing. Tried to do the exact opposite thing. Tried to go the opposite direction from God as far as possible. Endangers others and ends up being eaten by a giant fish. The text seems to indicate that he died from it, and he is crying out to God from Sheol, the place of the dead. He's repenting. Well, the Lord speaks to the fish, and it pukes him up on dry land, and he's resurrected. He's okay. A massive act of grace. Eaten by a fish, resurrected, and deposited on dry land. A serious reversal of fortune in his favor. I'm sure he was feeling that that was some pretty amazing grace. What's good for me seems to become unfair, though, if it's you. That's incongruence, and nobody's laughing. Why do we do that sort of thing? What's the disconnect? I think it's the thing that made me think about Star Trek in the first place. There's a problem with our propulsion systems, a common problem on the Enterprise. One of the early things I learned in seminary was to think of God not as compelling us to action, but as the Holy Spirit propelling us to action. Compelling is more of a robot thing, where propulsion is more of a sailboat starship thing. The problem with our propulsion system is our quarreling with the Holy Spirit. We have an established mission. It's more than the original crew of the Enterprise's five-year mission. It's as Picard said on The Next Generation. It's our continuing mission. The mission is the building of the kingdom of God. To accomplish the mission, a trajectory has been set. It's to go beyond where we have gone before. Our problem is that in quarreling with the Spirit, we fold our arms like furled sails. Ultimately, the forces of the Spirit will drive us forward as a wind drives any object on the water. But as we cooperate and unfurl our sails and embrace God's seemingly unbusinesslike plan, we gain momentum. The goal is, like in space travel, to achieve escape velocity. In space travel, you're escaping the gravitational pull of a cosmic body. In our faith journey, the mission is to escape the gravitational pull of ourselves and our selfish desires. We find ourselves all too often, like the illustrations of Jonah 
and the vineyard, focused on what's in it for us. Not long after the time of Martin Luther, poet Jean Don wrote, No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. I think we sometimes like to see ourselves as islands, though, or at least act like it. We are definitely bodies, though, with a gravitational pull. Martin Luther went on to build on St. Augustine's uh, observation that we are a people that are incurvatus in se. It's a Latin phrase that means turned or curved inward on oneself. It's a theological term that describes a life lived for oneself rather than for God or for others. It can be thought of as a gravitational pull that affects everything a person does. For example, a person might love others, but then wonder what's in it for them. They might give to others, but wonder what they're going to receive back. We often live in orbit about ourselves, and that is what sin is. Why do we do it? Well, it's an age-old problem. We so often fail to comprehend God's gift of abundance and sufficiency. The theology of abundance is a way of living that contradicts the individualism, consumerism, and capitalism that dominates the world today. It is a mindset that frees people from scarcity mentality and allows them to freely give resources to others. A scarcity mentality makes it much easier to tolerate oppression, but then draws the line at generosity, as those in the reading do today. If Jeremiah, oh, excuse me, in Jeremiah, the Lord speaks and says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. A scarcity mentality provokes us to selfishness, hoarding, and inaction. We stay in a tight orbit around our self-interest. The Spirit speaks to propel us, though, to an escape velocity. Let's open our arms and unfurl our sails to the reality that we are not islands and that we are diminished when others suffer or fall. The band Metallica was inspired by the book For Whom the Bell Tolls, which was inspired by the John Donne poem. In the end of the song, it says, Shattered gold fills his soul with a ruthless cry. Stranger now are his eyes to this mystery. Here's the silence so loud. Crack of dawn. All is gone except the will to be. Now they see that will what will be. Blinded eyes to see for whom the bell tolls. In the dawn, in the shining sun, in the light of Christ, we clearly see our interconnectedness as children of God. Jesus said, Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artesian spring from within, gushing fountains of endless life. Amen. Amen.